Coming Down to Earth, an online conflict transformation summit to explore pathways towards regenerative cultures in a divided world. My name is Nuno da Silva, and I'm one of the hosts of this summit, together with another friend who was, is here with us also today. Hi, Ben. Welcome, Ben Roberts. And the third colleague, Eva Schoenfeld, who cannot be with us. And we are very happy to have Yuri Neumeyer with us today for a great conversation. Welcome, Yuri. Thank you. Yuri is, uh, was born in a small village near the Sea of Galilee and is now based in central Italy at the shores of Lake Transimeno. He is uh, well versed and experienced in facilitating with activating the untapped collective intelligence and dormant creativity in communities, organizations, and multi-stakeholders ecosystems. He, has tra he was trained with uh, world-leading experts in theater of the oppressed, in drag and dreaming, and social presence in theater. I think you consider yourself a, a transdisciplinary research practitioner of, of these practices and... Uh, yeah, you have a very interesting uh, journey. You've trained and, and mentored, was mentored by Hector Aristizabal, with whom you created Imagine, ImagineAction.org, and you've dedicated your energy to bring transformative power of the arts, to turn wounds into blessings, what is to what if, into communities and organizations. Welcome again, Yuri. Uh, perhaps it would be great we start with um, just inviting you to share a bit of your journey um, from the times of growing up in a little village in Galilee to, to coming to this, this um, body of practices and being a, research, a transdisciplinary researcher uh, using arts to catalyze communities. Uh, and organizations. Could you could you tell us a bit more how you've came to this kind of work? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, really happy, uh, honor to be with you. Um, yeah, I'm I'm calling to you from my garden in in Italy, <laughs> uh, near uh, Trasimeno Lake. There might be some wind that is picking up now. Um, but it's, it's very similar in a way to when my mother came here to visit us uh, last year. Uh, she came to see this house, this new rented house where we came into. So it's like, whoa, that's very similar to the house your father built, you know, where you grew up. <laughs> uh, you know, and then there is uh, the lake. I, I used to, I, from the end of my uh, house where I grew up, uh, you could see the Lake of Galilee, um, Sea of Galilee, but it's a lake. It's more or less the same size as Lake Trasimeno. And also this this being around um, um, nature, around the house um, and the uh, fruit trees. And uh, yeah, in a way I, I feel I feel that, that I'm uh, recreating that for my child as well. This, uh, this beautiful memories of childhood, of growing up in a beautiful place near nature, very protected. Um, but then of course, um, this protected, um, the fact that it's protected, it means that there is something that we're protected from. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, I, I grew up, I was born in 1983, it was just a, a year after the the year after the first Lebanon war uh, ended, uh, which was affecting very much the north of Israel, the part where I was born in, and uh, they say after a war more boys are born. <laughs> it's a statistic, um, and uh, you know to kind of uh, catch up <laughs> on uh, and. Um, and and I think I, I really had a, a beautiful childhood and 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 um, but then the the I was being raised in a situation that was also abnormal, <laughs> that was uh, um, abnormal. Uh, but then 
growing up to abnormal, you don't know it's not normal. <laughs> uh, normal is, is very, we are very uh, adaptive. Uh, that's what I feel as human beings. We're extremely adaptive. We're able to create normal in a prison. We're able to create normal in a madhouse. We, the normal, you can see hear about books about Auschwitz and the and you can see how even there normal is created uh, so uh, so it, it, I was a normative boy growing up in the Galilee but there, there was nothing was normal like nothing is normal now and uh, I, I you know growing up I I went to the army. Uh, it's obligatory in Israel, but it's not just obligatory as a law. It's obligatory because it's a social agreement. Uh, your brothers, your father did that. Uh, it's part of the story. It's part of the, your... Um, your the, the, there are cases of refusing, but usually it comes from very, uh, I would call social bubbles. Uh, uh, in Tel Aviv, some groups. So because so it... Cause it I, I feel society is a very social thing. So we're social beings. And uh, going out against something like that, which is so such a strong social agreement, it, you need a support network. And this happens. So, so uh, But that was not my case. I, I, I was not. Um, and, and so I found myself in a... In a not really. I didn't really like this idea of being in the army, uh, but I or or being in a combat situation. But it, somehow I found myself in that situation, like many other boys, like many other men in in Israel. And I I spent my military service doing um, in combat engineering, being a tunnel rat. Uh, our 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 military mission was uh, connected to the tunnels that were dug in Gaza. Um, either to smuggle uh, products and sometimes weapons, or as a tool to, um, you know, um, conduct attacks on military outposts or 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 other attacks. Um, in 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 what was at the time Gaza was uh, settled uh, still uh, by uh, uh, Israeli settlements. So th there was a big forces of army around and inside Gaza. Uh, this was 2002 to 2006. So the second intifada, which uh, started in the West Bank, but then sort of continued in Gaza uh, all that time. Um, uh, so uh, our role was to go search for tunnels and when tunnels are found to go into the tunnels and uh, uh, Demo, demolate them so to put explosive so it's included being a lot of time underground <laughs> when so sometimes we were like 10 hours underground in a small hole that you can not even turn around in most cases you uh, um, uh, sometimes uh, more than 10 meters deep one kilometer long um, and um, and 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 in situation in Rafa in which a lot of shooting is going on a lot of bombs um, in an incident that's connected to my um, team uh, was became very famous as uh, not, not, not for the good reason uh, <laughs> uh, because uh, it, it was uh, targeted and, and exploded. They had explosive on it. So everybody in the, in the armed vehicle died. And there was this famous image. It was the image of the year in photojournalism of this soldier searching for pieces of of uh, flesh in the sand, uh, because the the for for bringing it to burial, because it's part of the Jewish tradition that you have to bring something of the person to burial, or you should be able to bring as much as possible uh, to burial of the flesh. And um, so this was th this were friends of mine, and I did not go to that mission, but um, it was a very intense army service and uh, following that I, I was left with a lot of images not just the, the my friend who died and the question of why did I survive which I think that everyone going through something like that is left with uh, 
but also the images of destruction that I was causing, that we were collectively causing there in, in Gaza. So Gaza, going into Gaza, I can only describe entering to an operation to Gaza is entering to this black, oily cloud of despair. This, this, it's just, I felt like almost liquid going into those spaces, like that flowing into this cloud of despair and, and fear and fear. And I have a lot of memories, which are images because I don't have a continuous like memory of that period, more like flashes, you know, like a slideshow. And, and, and I have a memory of kind of moving with kind of arm going through this sandy, sandy slums area. And uh, there was a, a group of women and, and one of them looked at me and she was terrorized. She had this fear, you know, this, and realizing that she was afraid of me. <laughs> um, and so, so this sort of images, this sort of questioning were activated in me going out of the army. And um, I didn't intentionally, there was not a process in which I said, okay, I need to work that through. I did not seek any professional help, although people that were with me were doing that. Uh, a good friend was recognized as post-traumatic stress and was, you know, um, but I was unof unofficially doing that. <laughs> like a lot, I think, of young Israelis are do that. Uh, they either go to a trip in South America or India and, you know, get stoned as much as they can. <laughs> um, and um, um, it's just restarting this, the brain, everything. Um, so in a way, I was doing that. And, and, and that's also the way the theater some, somehow found me or I found theater. And I um, actually, one of the friends that died in the army, his father is a famous actor in a, one of the theaters in Israel. And I met him through the grief, you know, and, and this is where the first time I was in a theater, uh, the backstage when he was kind of going on stage and in this big theater. And um, so I, when I went to university, I took one course and then I, I just continued. And I think through the theater work, through learning and practicing theater, I was starting to reconstruct different aspects of my own story and the old story, which did not fit anymore because I, 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 I felt betrayal in many ways. I felt betrayal by the army, by everyone that put me in that situation, impossible situation, without telling me even the truth of that situation. Because the more I went into researching that, the more I, I saw like how, how fragile and, um, and, 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 and questionable is that great truth <laughs> that brought me to, to almost lose my life and you know, be part of such destruction, which I feel uh, was not helping anyone. Um, so, so this is... Uh, how I went into theater in a way and um, and at some point in, in university it was already I, I heard about theater of the oppressed and I read the book of Augusto Boal and this was wow this was really and I knew that that I'm going to be working with that uh, and although I didn't know anything about it. Like the, that, the two things that hit me, the word oppressed that I never heard about before, just it came as a, as a, as a whole new idea. Um, but also this idea of that art or culture, um, you know, the, the, the way we know it is actually serves to kind of maintain the story. Uh, and, and, the, and, and that really spoke to me because, oh, th this is how I got there. <laughs> uh, and this is how it works. And this curiosity of how this mechanism, which created me, which brought me there, uh, is created, uh, was kind of the first input into this world. Um, and at the time, also through other tools, contact improvisation, capoeira, the body, the body was also very important, was coming in. 
because the, the army the army is extremely mechanized on the body. You do in the first training, basic training, it's it's all about you build your body, but you, the way you build your body is a way in which the, the mind takes full control of the body. It's, yeah, to the point of being mechanical, right? That you have to yes. you have to respond mechanically to the stimulus in a way that is fast. Yes. And, yeah. and and the way it's done is to bring you to the threshold of pain again and again and crossing it again and again in different so it's 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 kind of mind over body very very strong and and it it's done in order to do two things that otherwise you would not soldiers would not work work would not work because human beings are not designed to put themselves in danger <laughs> and they're not designed to kill other people so the, in order to rewire the brain to do these two things that we're not designed to do, you need to break the person. And you need to, and also you need to kind of rewire everything. And this is part of any military training, I believe. Um, so for me, the theater came and, and the body work came as, at the time, unconscious way to re, rewire my rewiring. <laughs> Um, and then as I was going forward, I, I, I kept searching. So this is why I say I'm, I'm researching because I, I felt that I was not getting enough answers or tools from theater of the oppressed. So I went on um, researching. And, and this is where um, other... Um, ways came and a research around also the work that reconnects and permaculture um, in terms of frameworks and then in terms of practice dragon dreaming and and social presencing theater uh, in theory you that I think provided me and provides me of a more complex view of that process in which uh, we get constructed and how we can reconstruct our reconstruction <laughs> of, of, of um, emerging out of that, what I consider a nightmare, a nightmare, <laughs> I, I, a nightmare. And, and, and as I lived in, in one of the edge points of that nightmare, <laughs> um, I, 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 I know it's a nightmare and I know that sometimes you live in your bubble and you have a beautiful house in a beautiful place and you, you don't realize, like I was did not realize that you live in a nightmare because maybe you are not in the side in which it's so nightmarish every day, but the nightmare is still going on. And some other level, you're, you're living that nightmare even if you're not feeling it on your skin. Yes, that, that's that's awesome, uh, Yuri. I, I think you, you pointed out to, to really two very important things. One one is how much uh, no normality can be constructed in a way that is really makes something very deviant for what is the human nature to become uh, the normal, and that raises a lot of questions about. As in the current moment of history, we are in, in human in, in human existence, and how much also this moment of COVID is asking us to to pause and rethink what is the normal we wanna we wanna be in as this comes comes to a, to an end, right? And and this other is this aspect you mentioned about. Yeah, that sometimes we might be living. Uh, nightmares, but not really being conscious about it, right? Because we don't see. I mean, there's there's different entrance and exit points of a of a of a nightmare, and we might be inside a nightmare or co-creating nightmares without seeing the results of of our own behaviors and and lifestyles, which also feels feels great. You mentioned a, 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 a lot of bodies of practices, and I'm, I'm kind of curious because you, you, we've also been talking a bit like how you also have this, this kind of research 
uh, lens or res research hat in the middle of this. What have you been exploring? I mean, what have you been discovering through your explorations with different arts and different uh, art practices in terms of how, I'm curious to see like how hard art worked for you to, to do some of the things you mentioned. One is to uh, come to terms with, with your past experiences and, and also come to terms with how that those shifted you in ways that needed some sort of integration. So I'm curious just to hear a bit more of how you think, how are, have arts worked for you and what that opened up for you in terms of thinking of the role of arts in, in amidst, you know, situations like you lived of, of, of uh, ongoing conflict uh, in the case of in, in Israel and Palestine, but also in, in you know, in your own, life journey and, and the, the conflicts and traumas, difficult issues you've been, you've been going through. Um, yeah. So, so for, for me, I, I'll go to art in, in a moment, but first theater, for me, theater is a technology, is an innovative technology. Um, and, and, and innovative I, I, already with uh, thousands of years of... Of yeah, I, I think I think while it has maybe thousands of years old, it's still innovative. And I feel it's innovative because with all the sciences and the technologies we've created, we still don't have a better technology to understand ourselves mm. than theater. And and why is that? Because and I think it's the mother of technology. And Boal has a story about that in one of his books, because it's it's the theater that allows us to see us ourselves from the outside. Hmm. Uh, and this is the mother of technology because without that, almost the other sciences are not possible. If we are not able to see ourselves from the inside, to outside, and also to identify in something that is not us, that could be us, um, then, then all the other things are almost not possible. It's uh, interesting you say that. Just let me give, give, put a, a parenthesis here because I, you know I lived in in East Timor for for some years, and and theater is a new phenomenon there. But one thing I realized because I also like you, I've practiced theater of the oppressed for for a long time, was for me very curious when I start working with theater. There is that. They don't have theater, but they have theater because they have theater is embedded in their lives, in the rituals and in the ceremonies that they translate. And I'm, I'm, for me, was very curious to see that somewhere along history of human of, of humans, someone start to look at this, understand this, and think like, well, actually, we can do other rituals with which was this kind of creating a scenic space and and offering a an opportunity for people to 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 have a um, a look at society and themselves in it. So that yeah, just that parenthesis yeah. I found very interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Then and and then it's it's also important to say when when you say theater, do you mean what we call theater as a Western society or theater as a larger phenomenon? And and I'm speaking here about theater as something that is you know also storytelling around the fire is is probably where we started to do what I call theater. Uh, and um, so, so there is the newer phenomena, let's say, that maybe started in Greece, maybe in some other places at the same time, in which it becomes a, somehow an institution in itself, mm. uh, or it becomes a form, you know, an art form. So then there are art forms, uh, which, you know, has a, its own kind of, language, but it is the rituals um, that makes our living that are theater as well. So this is also connected with how uh, we live life as a theater somehow. Um, and, um, <laughs> and yeah, so yeah, like life is, it could be theater. And, and, and I like uh, Arawana, uh, the social printing theater teacher, mentor, founder, uh, she, she brings up the thing that the word theater from Greek comes from where the audience sits, not where the stage is. Mm. And it comes from the word of seeing. 
And it means actually seeing something, a place from which to see something of meaning. And, and so, and, and the theater is created through the eyes of the witness, of the, of the audience, not through the, the actor. And, and, and this is, and, and in that way, we can make everything into theater through our witnessing. If I just start looking at nature and, and, and see something of meaning in that, I create a theater. When I, when, I, when I look with meaning and I search for meaning, I create theater in my looking on it. Mm. Um, and, then, and then I can, you know, and then it can become more complex and we can have actors and spectators and, and we can have like in theater of the oppressed people moving from that position. That's, that, that might be worth just pointing out to people because if, if I mean, we both know, but maybe there's not an awareness of a lot of people that theater, as it emerged, the story you, you mentioned, well, might, might have uh, showed up in, other, in, in multiple places, but the story usually said it came in Greece and was a lot around. I mean, although, although I, I love your perspective of the, of the audience, the, 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 it was not the audience who decided the themes of the plays in, in Greece. So there's this sense also that somehow some of the theaters that were used for the general public, for the general audience to entertain, they were chosen as a way also to do some catharsis with the, with the population in a sense of, you know, through theater you could allow people to live certain experiences and then diffuse their wish for some sorts of revolutions or feelings of, of, of a lot of... of um, inequalities and different things, right? Different injustices that could, that could lead to social unrest. Uh, but but Theatre of the Oppressed, from the perspective of Augusto Boal, is a step further in, in democratizing theatre. So it's allowing more fluidity between audience and stage. Could you just briefly talk a bit about that? Because yeah. it feels like a yeah, major I, I, shift. Yeah. And, and although it is important to say about the classical theater, that the, the true classical theater, the, the period of 100 years, which, by the way, simultaneously to the time of Greek democracy and Greek theater, uh, live in the same period of 100 years. So actually what we know, know now know that the plays were written by the so-called famous writers, which were more like writers, directors, but the performers were people, just normal people of the community, and they were performing to themselves. And, and, and likely they would have been even very active in the creation of the play somehow. So in that period, and it was part of the, the, this experiment, the democratic experiment, which lasted only 100 years, uh, in, in Athens, the, this was integrative to that collective process that was experimented there theater was part of that but at the moment this ended then theater started to kind of mutate and and what you're saying started to happen more later with the roman theater and then in the other iterations of it in which it was uh used by uh non-democratic powers <laughs> uh for, Red, for manipulation. yeah uh so so and a lot of the, the dramatic processes that we st still consume through hollywood and through other are processes that are mutation of the original that happened in imperial time and later. And, and so, so this is important to say about that we, we cannot, it's a post-classical theater we're living through that was then mutated a few times. Uh, and, and in a way, in that sense, you can say that Augusto Boal is trying to go back and he, he, when he read his book, he goes back up to Plato so he tries to go back uh, into some of the origin because what happens with the forum theater, which is one of the forms of theater of the press, um, is that is going back to this idea and this practice in which people, non-actors, non-artists, use theater to tell their story and then to share that story with the same community or other communities and then use that for dialogue. And then happens something that, as far as we know, did not happen in classical times, which is, this is one of the innovations of form theater in which the audience can become an actor. 
So that's also part of that um, ritual, this new ritual, um, um, in which, again, this this idea and and Boal speaks about that a lot about and the passivity that is created and in culture and how we become a, this passive audience to 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 culture to politics to everything so so we're just kind of seeing and 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 uh powerless or or delegating our power to those on the stage in such a way uh and and that's what he and the theater of the press kind of tries to agitate and and break so so moving from a uh, away from a passive spectator to a spect actor that's that's yeah. it because yeah so he even says is like uh, breaking apart from our numbness of of the of the repetition right so it remind me of something you said about reconfiguring because there's a lot of work on body and senses so that we become aware of how our habits and our style of work or things that kind of are part of on the daily basis of our lives make us feel make us uh restrained in a certain set of gestures and different perceptions about about reality that's really yeah yeah he used the terms demechanization yeah and and uh, the book uh against for actors and non-actors has this series of seeing what we see uh, uh listening to what we hear you know so um, yeah, it's like through the senses somehow um, um, because that's what happens. This is what happens when we become consumers of cultures, passive consumers through cell phones. Or th- so we, um, it becomes a situation in which the reality is there. So it, it happens the situation that people, I, I forgot how it was the story, but basically something was happening on a, on a tram. But then they didn't believe it was real until it was on the news. So, <laughs> right. the, the news are more real than my own experience of the world. Mm-hmm. And and you know and and in the pandemic, people you can really see that how people are giving more value to what is on the news to what they experience, and they perceive the world through the news as the truth. Even if the news is some post that was you know sent by a bot <laughs> even yeah. that it has more power than my own perception sensor perception of the world yeah or or then or then the worst is that not having a, a a very sharp perception of the world explored and then having uh what used to be the the kind of uh real authority of reference is not anymore and you navigate in this sea of conspiracy theories and all sorts of different sense making of what's going on uh, acknowledging that we live in a very broken ecosystem right in terms of information and sources of knowing because you know in a way for many of us what used to be a source of knowing and, and i i live what you're saying with my family because i go and have conversations on at the lunchtime with them about some of the issues going on and i offer my humble perspective and after uh, two weeks, they hear it on the news and then come to say to me, oh, yeah, no, it's, I, I heard this. This is really shift my mind. I said, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, and I, 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 yeah. I'm fascinated by this, you know, the connection between the notion of artist, non-artist, actor, non-actor, um, you know, the passivity of the audience and this larger story context, you know, we're having these conversations in around the idea of, of a fundamental shift in the human presence on the planet and the idea that there are new stories being told, but people are not hearing them, you know, that they're, they're embedded in a thing they call normal that's really a nightmare you know, but we accept it as is reality. This is that this is what an economy is. This is what work is supposed to be like. This is how you earn a living or fail to do that. And uh, you know, this is why we need war. All of these things. And it seems to me there's a there's a direct connection between the passivity 
of the consumer and the audience that we've been trained into and the acceptance of this nightmare as, as you know, normal and inevitable. And that part of the shift is to move into this role, uh, you know, where instead of, I mean, there's also a parallel like between leaders and followers, right? Versus everyone being a leader, everyone having agency, uh, everyone being in some ways an artist, right? Um, and I wonder how much of our conflict within activist realms, within the realms of people who see this transformation, want to serve it, but get stuck with one another is because somehow still these old patterns, um, you know, of passivity, of, of um, you know, of thinking I'm not an artist and, or I'm not a leader, um, I'm not an expert, are, are part of what happens that, that gets us stuck. Or is it that we're still just learning to reframe ourselves as, yes, I am an artist. Yes, I am a leader. Uh, you know, yes, I, I, you know, I can tell new stories that other people will believe. I, you know, I'm sort of curious how you connect all this up to, you know, to this realm, you know, that, that, that sparked the whole summit around some, you know, conflicts showing up in, in domains like the Transition Towns movement. Yeah. So actually... Um, so, I, you know, the, my three main methodologies of reference is theater of the oppressed and social pressing theater and then dragon dreaming, although dragon dreaming is not, is not officially uh, an art form or theater approach. Uh, but for me, it's actually a, a project design approach um, or, or, you know, uh, participatory project design and, and, and management. But there is something there about stories. And today I was interviewing John towards Croft, the creators of the Creator of Dragon Dreaming, towards a webinar we have in July. And the, the sentence that I, I was that was for me when, when I was in a Dragon Dreaming workshop with John, he said something about time and how, how and story and how uh, you know, we tend to think about time as linear, but then if we go back to our memories, it's actually a jumps. It jumps, you know? So it, so if you remember your first memory and try to think what happened the next day, it, you don't know, you know? So actually it's a series of this kind of dots. So, and that creates the story. That's our story. Uh, and, and then he said something, you are not your story. You are the storyteller of your story. And that was like, whoa. <laughs> I was like, yes. And that's, that's the thing. We are, the, we are not, we, and we get confused that we are the, our stories, individually and collectively. While the truth is that we are the one telling those stories. And once we become aware of that, that we are the storytellers, uh, so much is being unleashed on the individual and the collective level. And that's connected with the art, being an artist, because being an artist for me, in that aspect, in the wider aspect, you know, whether you call yourself an artist, where do you exhibit anything in your life, is your uh, capacity to tell the, your own story and create this new story for yourself and the world through you. And, and that's the capacity of creating a, and becoming fully a storyteller of the story. Um, and that's, that's a power that I think uh, Augusto Boal was also reaching out for. So giving theater as a tool for empowering, for liberation means we are kind of regaining our right as artists and as creators, as storytellers. Um, and and, the, and and then there is an aspect of that which is actually about and which I like about the social presence in theater and theory you, which is also some humility into that. So at the same time that this is true, we are the storytellers, we are also part of a greater story, and it's about listening in mm. to what is being called for us. So there is also <clears throat> something else that when we listen to nature and we listen to our body, we listen to what, to the wisdom uh, that comes with that, then and we see that we are the storytellers and there is a story and that there is a other stories and we are part of that. So uh, kind of balance 
connecting all of that, the, the, the power, the empowering ourselves to be artists and stories, and then weaving ourselves into the web of life and, and to the wisdom that is there always available for us. Well, and yeah. that's part of the new story is to reclaim that connection, right? And maybe that's the difference between the, the wild conspiracy theories you're talking about. You know, I mean, any, we can tell crazy stories and those serve certain purposes, but then there's stories that are deeply grounded in who we really are. Like you say, yeah. that the army is all about training us to not be who we are. But, in the end of the day, it's also that all all conspiracy theories have have some element of truth in it. We know we know that after it happens, right? There's numerous stories of of, consp- of real conspiracy theories that took place. So there's a hint on on some some aspect of truth there. But I'm also I was also going to add that arts, besides what you said, Yuri also comes to me as a as a way of pointing out to. Uh, blind spots and two spaces that are, are usually excluded from our conscience thinking and also from the collective consciousness, right? So they offer, they, yeah. they are entry points into opening up our, our understanding of what's really going on, what's happening and what we might not be seeing. And th- that for me is particularly relevant with SPT because there's this sense that the body doesn't lie, right? We can play tricks with our minds you know, pretend pretend that something about ourselves or about each other is is not. I mean, doesn't exist. My mind is not aware of it. It doesn't exist. But then our body is telling the whole story or just showing it. We have we have not so much time. It's amazing how this time flies. So it would be great if we kind of also explore a bit of of our last time, maybe exploring a bit the intersection between some of the things we mentioned and situations of conflict. So we've been talking about, you know, through your journey about arts as a way for you to reconfigure some of your experience, to find new meanings, um, art as a, as, a, as a space of reconfiguration and rethinking of reality. And, and what, else, what else you feel from your journey and from your work with these different bodies of practice, you feel relevant to share at the, this intersection between arts, dealing with conflicts and having, having another look at conflicts and, and how we can use arts in a different way. Yeah. So, and I'm going to try to bring that to my own experience because this is what I feel, that we can only speak on our own experience. That does not mean we cannot speak about everything because our own experience is deeply rooted with everything else. <laughs> um, so, so I was born into deck conflict. We even call that, it's called deck conflict. There are some places which you, you have a conflict and in Israel, you have the conflict because this is how it's used. And the question is why? The question why is that conflict so more talked about than other conflicts? Because it's it is very devastating, and and but it's not as bloody as some other conflicts, and it, it's not even um, you know significant in some aspects to it. But it is significant because there are other layers to it. And these other layers, these deeper layers, which are connected with um, the myth somehow, uh, the myth, and, and, and also some of the trauma, the accumulated trauma of living on this planet, uh, trying to live on this planet as human beings, um, and, and, and that are, and what I understood, so theater of the press for me was a gate, and then the other layers were revealing something that was going deeper into that layers. And the social presence theater was a part of going deeper to those layers and understanding and the micro and macro. So how all this, the greater conflict outside lives inside of me and how there is this connection between those and, and, and how at some level, um, what I felt that being of service to this outer conflict, it means to really go in deep into what it means inside of me and changing my own 
interrelation and touching some things that are more, you know, so I've been doing this uh, work also on healing other conflicts that are through my bloodline. Uh, I was uh, Jewish from Ger German Jewish and Roman Romanian Jewish, European Jewish, and working through that bloodline and doing ritual, healing rituals around that through theater. Uh, and I, I realized, and there was a lot of moments in that journey, which I think were enabled because I was allowing myself to dig deeper, to fall deeper into these layers uh, in which I could see this connection between um, what we call reality, consensual reality, and what sits underneath. And, and, and I feel we should be able to, to meet the reality in all its levels. We shouldn't uh, limit ourselves to just looking and, and, and conflict on the superficial sur surface. We need to see what's underneath. And we, and we can also get, can get lost in the underneath. So it's like, it's important to have this kind of wide spectrum of observation. And mm, yeah, and, and what I, I feel, I think we, we all have our own path that uh, is waiting for us. And, um, and, and this path is a discovery path, which is connected with realizing who we really are and what's our talent, our gift through our wounds. This, this comes a lot with the mentorship, the mentoring with Hector and seeing that and seeing that in me. That was the process of, of realizing that. And, um, and, and now, you know, I, I said I was very rebellious to art when I came to Theatre of the Oppressed at that moment because of all the criticism. Now I'm going back to the art uh, from a different perspective because now I can see that the artist works on this other layers. The artist, it, does, it could seem that the artist is detached from reality, but the artist can touch these other layers. And it's, and, 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 and it's, it's, it's our role, and I think it is also our role to spread awareness that we are all capable of that. We're all capable of this, uh, being an artist, which means going deeper into what is around us um, and going deeper. And, and from there, creating and understanding that there is a depth. Thank you so much, Yuri. I think we'll, we'll have to finish. So perhaps you can make a final round with comments or something to add if you want. Then we can start by you if you, if you have something and then so that we can close. We are right on time. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting with one of the, the later things you just said around um, the, collect, the layers of collective trauma that sit below you know, the, the, the energy around the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and why that's had so much, uh, so much power and presence and, and has been so impactful. And I'm connecting it to the global situation we're in now where we're all living through these layers of trauma that maybe aren't as, well, I mean, climate change in many ways is as obvious as, as the Holocaust um, or the Nakba. Uh, uh, and yet, you know, so, so it seems to me that how we, the stories we tell or the stories we don't tell, the degree to which we're, you know, aware of the, the nightmare of the dominant paradigm or embedded in it and think it's normal has something to do with how much we're able to sit with that trauma and recognize how it's, it's living in us and others and, and come to that then from a place of compassion and empathy which I think is underneath how we work generatively with, with conflict, right? Um, so that's something I'm taking away from this. And, and that, that there's something, that our skill in doing that has something to do with claiming ourselves, our, our own artistic and creative capacities, our own role as a storyteller and as a witness. Um, and that nurturing and developing those skills are fundamental to, to working through these times. 
Yuri, you wanna leave some final comments to to those uh, hearing us? Yeah, I I feel that there is um we we all have a our song, our dance, our inner cre creation always um, alive in us. And the invitation that I might have for people seeing this is to listen in to this spring, this source of creativity flowing all the time and, and saying yes to that, uh, whatever that means. Uh, drawing, singing, <laughs> dancing around, um, and you know, um, and knowing that this is important. <laughs> this is important, as as important as anything can be. Um, and and playing, playing. Um, the few days ago, my daughter was playing, and you know her her eyes kind of kind of go up, and she speaks with this imaginary things, you know, so with this imaginary people, and working. and uh, and I realized that this is not she's not just playing, this is real. She's actually creating or communicating with other dimensions in that moment. That that this thing that we we call playing. We see children play. It's 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 really a creative force, and 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 connecting with that possibility, saying yes to that, and saying yes to that possibility, uh, we can really do the impossible, which seems impossible right now, but uh, it's possible if we believe that it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Yuri. Thank you, Ben, for coming. It has been lovely to, to have this conversation with you, with the birds on your background, which are a great presence, and the blue sky behind you. I was just reminded of Gota's perception of colors, that blue actually, it's, it's emerging. We see blue, we see the sky as blue because of the vast, dark, empty space meeting the, the light of the sun. And yeah, it just it just left me this conversation with a lot of nuances, a lot of things to explore further. So I invite everybody listening to us to get in touch with some of the um, research that Yuri is doing on an ongoing basis and some of the practices he mentioned around theory, you, theater of the oppressed, social presence in theater and, and uh, dragon dreaming. And so I hope you enjoy listening to us as much as we enjoy having this conversation. Thank you once again, dears. Thank you.